Hello, everyone, and welcome to Market Talks. I'm Ray Salmond, head of markets here at Cointelegraph. In this show, we discuss the latest in what's shaping the markets with valuable insights from industry leaders, traders, and influencers. On this week's episode of Market Talks, we have a very special guest, uh, Lark Davis, who has been actively involved in the world of cryptocurrency since 2017. He is a Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, and stock investor with years of experience making consistent profits in this market. Uh, he boasts over 1 million followers on Twitter. He has over 470,000 YouTube subscribers. He is also the author of a crypto newsletter called Wealth Mastery. Uh, a fun fact is that Lark was actually an English teacher before he ventured into the world of cryptocurrencies. Um, here's a short video about Lark. So welcome, Lark. Thanks for coming on today. Thanks for having me on. Excited to be here. Yeah, yeah. But you're, you know, you've been a guest that we've wanted to have on for a while, and uh, your story is quite fascinating. So, just to kick things off, I kind of want to know how did you get into cryptocurrency, and why are you still deeply interested in cryptocurrency? You know, it's funny with crypto. When I first heard about Bitcoin, it was 2012. Didn't buy it. But uh, I heard about it. We were talking about it with my colleagues at the uh, political studies department. And I thought, wow, it's amazing. It sounds awesome. But I need beer money for this weekend, so I'm not going to buy any Bitcoin. It's a costly weekend. Um, later on in 2017, um, I had a conversation with my mom about crypto, and she was sort of going down the rabbit hole. And it's like, I really need to look at that crypto thing again. And I started diving in and just you get lost. You get lost very quickly. And it's funny with content creation. I actually started off on a, a platform. I don't even really use it anymore, but it was called the Steam blockchain. And it was kind of like a social media place where you could get, you know, post stuff and get upvotes, which would be worth money and all that fun stuff. And so I started doing that and that was fun. I was like, this is cool. I'm enjoying making content. I'm enjoying engaging with people. And Eventually, though, writing out all those articles got a bit crazy, so I started posting on YouTube because it was a lot quicker to just record my thoughts on a video, and then one thing led to another, and, you know, Twitter popped off, YouTube popped off, and just, yeah, I've absolutely loved uh, making content over all the years and investing in this space, and when you learn more about money and you learn more about the technology that's being made here with cryptocurrencies, it's it's deeply obsessive and you can't help but look away and be interested in what's going on. And that's kind of where I find myself today. Yeah, I agree. It's kind of always been a really super magnetic. When you first discover crypto, it's really um, like a black hole, not even a rabbit hole, right? And it's got a, a strong pool. And once you kind of hit that event horizon, you get sucked into the uh, you get sucked into the singularity and there's no coming out pretty much, I guess, unless you just get filthy rich, then some people seem to kind of like shake off their crypto addiction and become anonymous and go do something else with their lives and us crypto people never hear from them again. But generally, I feel like once you get into it, you're stuck in it. And something that kind of stood out to me that you said was that your mom was talking to you about cryptocurrencies. That's that's a bit odd. Like my mom has heard of Bitcoin, but not before it like becoming this central topic within my own life. So uh, tell me a little bit more about that. Well, she's definitely been skeptical of everything the government does for a long time, let's say. And so for her, Bitcoin was a pretty obvious area of interest, although I did end up buying Bitcoin before she did. She didn't pull the trigger. She took a little longer to pull the trigger on it. But um, she's, yeah, she's a crypto investor. She's got Bitcoin and Ethereum, a couple different altcoins, you know, and she just kind of sitting there riding it out, you know, buys a bit more and things get crazy and it's pretty, pretty um, low involvement investor, right? She's kind of passively hangs out with her crypto, but yeah, she's been in Bitcoin for quite a while. And so, yeah, it's a pretty cool lady. I think given the very short duration of bull markets, because in crypto, the bad times last a long time and then the good times happen so fast and they end quickly, right? So I think given that kind of boom and bust nature of crypto, if you're not a skilled trader who has time to actively be looking at charts and doing all that crazy stuff and trading all day long, which you can do and still rack up like tremendous losses, not profits, 
I think the kind of like passive approach and dollar cost averaging and just like slowly investing in crypto and living your life doing other things and maybe even having a job that has nothing to do with finance or crypto, that seems to be the most successful strategy for me and for others. Like it seems to be what works versus trading. What's your opinion on that? It really comes down to a question of time and ability. And I think for the average person, wife, kids, dog, job, social life, uh, it's really hard to try and find these top, you know, 100x crypto gems that come up every once in a while to be early to Pepe coin or whatever it might be. The average investor also is not 100% in crypto. Now, a lot of people who I engage with online are just crypto investors, right? And that's good reasons for that, right? But you have to have the time to be able to actually make that work for you. And if you are just a passive investor, like, oh, wow, I've heard about Bitcoin, I read about Bitcoin, saw a documentary on it, whatever, and it's really, really cool, and I'm really interested in it, then your average investor probably is going to be pretty well off with just Bitcoin and Ethereum, maybe a top altcoin or two, and you really don't need much more. You know, dollar cost average in, maybe add a bit more during the bear market periods, the accumulation periods, and just wait for that long-term sort of picture. Uh, they've done lots of interesting studies. For example, if you had just 1% of your total portfolio, so you have you know, your standard 60-40 stock bond split, right? Except you take out 1% of the bonds and you put in 1% in Bitcoin. That portfolio has dramatically outperformed the 60-40 split year after year after year, except you know maybe in um, terrible bear market situations where it hasn't outperformed as much. But the downside has been tiny and the outperformance has been massive. So it's a pretty attractive reason for the average investor to have 5% of their portfolio, for example, sitting in the top coins. Even right now, year to date, Bitcoin price is up 50%, um, outpacing equities markets. And even though equities markets have been surprisingly strong and doing well, everything rebounded well from whatever had crashed the market, all these continuous rate hikes. So um, yeah, I agree with mm -hmm. USC value and that approach. I like that you mentioned that, um, you know, that people might consider a 1% to 5% allocation of total portfolio to crypto. And I know that you have a lot of subs and a community that you're active in and newsletter subscribers and all that. So um, just anecdotally, what would you say is your kind of estimate on most the most of the crypto investors that you interact with, are they 100% in crypto? Are they 75% in crypto? Are they still keeping like a healthy allocation to stocks and a Roth IRA or contributing to their pension, thinking about buying real estate? Are they diversified or are most of these people kind of like degenerately overexposed to just crypto? <laughs> Meme coins and NFTs only, man. Um, <laughs> only, yeah. No, I think actually a large percentage of uh, the people who I engage with in my community, I think a lot of them are really invested across a, a wide spectrum of different assets. And it depends on the investor. Of course, some people are all about metals and real estates and Bitcoin, right? Some people are into tech stocks and they're into altcoins. And so it really depends on the different investor. But I think the 100% crypto only investor, that's kind of more of an exception than the rule these days. Because for me personally, right, I'm not 100% crypto, although Bitcoin is my single biggest investment out of everything. But over time, what I have been consistently doing is moving money out of the crypto market into the stock market and the metals and stuff like that in order to take that high risk money and turn it into lower risk. Well, you know, stocks can be kind of crazy too, but lower risk money overall, right, into those things that are a little bit safer. Because realistically, even if a tech stock is pretty damn volatile, it's nothing like holding an altcoin. Because the altcoin, when you have that token, all kinds of craziness can go on. And so many altcoin tokens go to zero. So if you held Netflix stocks, you bought the top, you held it down, what did it go down? 80, 90%. You still own Netflix stocks, and it's still a good company with hundreds of millions of customers and a lot of potential in the future versus a lot of the altcoins that we uh, speculate on those don't have such a great future and that once the price of those has gone down quite a bit, they're in really tough financial situations often, the companies are, because even if the developers had the best intentions and stuff like that, suddenly they don't have any money to pay for anybody anymore. They ran through their initial two, three, four million dollar raise in the first year or two years on developers and high intensity stuff. And then they were hoping, well, we're going to have this token treasury that we can draw from in the future, except that it's not worth anything anymore. So it's a very, very different Thing. And I think 
for most investors, unless you have that huge amount of time in your hands to really be able to go into the altcoin forest, be able to chase airdrops, get into new DeFi farms, all this kind of stuff, it can be pretty tricky. And that's, you know, it's part of what we do in our newsletter, Wealth Masteries. We talk about this different kind of stuff. There are the people who do want to find what's going on in the market, but don't have so much time, you know, because it's hard to find all that information. I agree. Yeah. Pretty much if you're a researcher, you need to carve out your own niche. It's near impossible to keep a pulse on ordinals, DeFi, LSDFi, Ethereum staking, on-chain data, Bitcoin price action, macro stuff, meme coins, like it's airdrop farming. It's, it's near impossible um, to do that. And I, I think that good investors figure out a process that works for them that's tried and true uh and you just repeat rinse wash repeat it's like you ideate prototype test and then produce something so uh, that's really interesting advice i like that one thing i would add is you know have that little bit of experimentation money on hand right it's one thing that um is also i suppose a, a risk to your portfolio so to speak is becoming um to, to a situation where you don't try anything new because like, well, what I have is works. And if it's works, great. You know, and that's, uh, that's definitely, I, 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 I really live by that motto. Like I know what works in my investing journey and I generally stick to that. However, uh, maybe it's because I'm a content creator and we do the newsletter and all this stuff. I'm always experimenting with stuff. I like trying out, um, you know, new DeFi platforms and spend a little bit of time farming airdrops and stuff like that, just cause it's, uh, I'm interested in the process. I'm interested in, in how it works, but it, it would be definitely something like I would never put you know a hundred percent of my Ethereum into some new DeFi farm, right? And that's I think the mistake a lot of people make. They think, oh, well, if I'm gonna do it, it has to be all or nothing. Instead of like, hey, you know what? I can actually take fifty bucks and just just play with this platform, try out this new blockchain just for fun to see how it works, to learn more about the technology, to learn more about the different applications that are available and what they do, and that kind of can give you a enough of a taste. To understand if like, well, you know, I went, I used Solana DeFi for a week and I spent 50 bucks on it and it was kind of cool, but you know what? It's just not worth my time and I'm cool. I'm happy that I've done it and I have the experience now, but now I know it's almost a confirmation of now I know that what I am doing and have been doing, which works, is what I should keep doing, right? So, yeah, I agree with you on that. I think that's uh, one of the kind of pitfalls of the Bitcoin maximalist is that they write everything off as being trash without even exploring it. Like they're kind of like electing to be Luddites and loyal to Bitcoin as the only option and seem okay to forego, you know, tremendous gains that could be, that could happen from, from kind of like exploring, um, these other opportunities. I did watch a video that you posted recently to your Twitter. Um, it was a short about buying ETH at $80 being a great opportunity. And you mentioned how Solana, Matic, or Polygon, Polydot, and Avalanche, or AVAX could be similar opportunities. Um, what's your rough assessment criteria for determining which of these coins might be able to run with the big dog, which I assume is Ethereum or yeah, Bitcoin? Yeah, yeah. Um, because you said, you know, there's some, some similarities and market cap comparisons from then till now and network activity, yada, yada, yada. There's a reason why Ethereum is successful. Um, I don't think prior to the NFT bull market or even DeFi summer, many people could identify that these would be the reasons why Ethereum became successful. Uh, but what are your just general assessment criteria for yourself trying to figure out which one of these coins, Sol, Matic, Dot, Avax, which one might be the one that could that could go big again? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. I mean, that video was really just making a simple market cap comparison because a lot of those coins were at a similar market cap to what actually Ethereum was at the bottom of the last bear market. And of course, Ethereum had the first mover advantage and the moat around Ethereum is pretty big. Although the opportunity I feel for all competing blockchains is also really big right now because as recent Pepe madness proved, I mean, I was paying $60, $70 to do a swap on Uniswap. Your average person simply cannot do that. It's absurd beyond belief to kind of pay those sort of fees. And that's not even as bad as got back in the you know 2021. I, I remember paying $150, $200 to do a swap on Uniswap and say, okay, I got to do it because, you know, one reason or another, but it's 
that's not awesome. And it's a long road towards Ethereum bringing on main chain uh, scaling solutions. So when I look at uh, and big Ethereum bull, by the way, they're going to figure it out. Layer two scaling solutions, all that stuff. The economics of Ethereum are massive. Second biggest back, but just so you guys understand that. However, I'm always looking at, well, what other coins have the potential to capture significant market share? And we've seen what we're seeing right now. It, it's so unlike the previous uh, bear market for smart contract platforms because 2017 Ethereum ICO boom, 2018, no purpose, right? ICOs were over. What were we going to do on the main Ethereum chain now? Oh, a couple things were starting to come out. I think MakerDAO launched in 2018, maybe 2019, early 2019. So we started to have a few things actually being usable on chain. We had some decentralized exchanges, but they were terrible. 2019 Uniswap, or maybe it was late 2018 Uniswap, finally started taking off and stuff like that. But it was really, really just very few use cases. The advantage that Solana, Avalanche, whatever else has right now is they just get to launch their technology and then plug everything straight in. They they can come in and say, okay, well, within a few months' time, we have DEXs, we have NFT platforms, we have DeFi platforms, we have games, all this stuff. We have devs who want to build on our blockchain because we're you know smarter, faster, whatever uh, sort of stuff. So looking at, okay, what can be the next big thing? Things that I keep an eye on, which is why, for example, I'm quite bullish on uh, Avalanche as an example. Do we see users showing up? Yes, we do. Do we see a mechanism that can help appreciate the price of the AVAX token over time? Yes, we can. That's They have a burning mechanism, much like Ethereum has. Do we see interesting scaling solutions that are going to add value to the network? Yeah, they have their subnets. That's definitely something that has the potential to do that there. Are developers showing up? Yes, they are. For example, uh, Off the Grid, it's um, a game backed by um, Neil Blomkamp, the guy who made District 9. So he's sort of the creative mind behind that. Uh, he's launching the him and the team. They're launching their game on uh, Avalanche. I'm an investor in Off the Grid, by the way, and an Avalanche, just so we're clear with that. But I am bullish on it for a reason, which is why I own it. And I think that we look at this sort of trend of okay, here it is. It's a bear market. This blockchain. The builders are still building stuff. They're still showing up. The metrics are actually growing during a bear market period. So that's the kind of stuff they're looking for. And it's not a perfect metric. Just to finish the thought here, because EOS did similar things in 2018. We saw a lot of metric uh, growth across the network, and then it completely failed because Block One completely abandoned it and walked away with their $4 billion and said, the community can run it now. So it's not always such an easy picture to say. Good assessment. So it's a mixture of fundamental analysis, technical analysis, and other factors like on-chain activity, developer activity, that sort of thing that exactly. kind of paint a picture of whether or not this could be a good investment. But in addition to that, investors should keep in mind that like macro events, central bank policy, mm. regulators' uh, distaste for all things crypto, these can all kind of like take the best laid plan and lead it to failure, can't they? Absolutely. And we've seen that be absolutely the case the last year to 18 months where it's all been about the macro. I mean, it's been the interest rates, it's been inflation, and now very specifically in crypto, which is so frustrating, right? Because uh, Apple just hit a new all-time high the other day. NVIDIA hit a new all-time high. We're seeing, you know, the NASDAQ looking pretty sweet recently and stuff like this. And yet crypto's down so much because we are very specifically as an industry under such intense scrutiny by U.S. regulators right now with major exchanges getting... Uh, sued by the SEC, even you know Coinbase. They they asked for years and years, can you please give us any kind of regulatory guidance? And they just said no. And then the lawsuit shows up, and so it's it's really a crazy situation for crypto specifically. And yeah, we're just going through the cycle. Twenty twenty three. I never expected that there would be a new all time high this year. I would be happy to be proven wrong. By the way, if if you market bulls want to pump us up to a new all time high, great. I'm here for that. Yeah, but I always thought 2023 is going to be kind of like 2019, and I still think we could go higher in 2023. My target was uh, 48K, but we'll see how we play out for the rest of the year. But I don't expect a new, a new all-time high before the Bitcoin halving, for example. So with all this macro crazy going on and, you know, the U.S. Treasury Department about to dump uh, what a, a trillion dollars of T-bills into the market, it's going to suck up a lot of liquidity for stocks and for crypto. Yep, I agree with you on that 48K kind of target for Bitcoin this year as probably the highest, maybe if there's some euphoric 
blow off top or squeeze on shorts, maybe 50, 55 K, but I'm afraid of a 55 K um, target being hit because then I think the retrace back to kind of like the medium price range will yeah. be pretty strong. Whereas <laughs> hitting 48 K is kind of like possibly where a lot of people are above break even and looking to take profit mm -hmm. and, you can begin to then look into the mid 30s as consolidation and support is that next leg up um, leading into the next halving cycle, yada, yada, yada. But of course, I dig it. We're, we're yeah, right. There's, same there's, there's, yeah, we're on the same <laughs> thing. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of moving pieces in, in that. Now, I like that you talk about um, the potential for new all time highs one day, but probably not in 2023. So what do you think? might be the major catalyst that propel Bitcoin price to a new all-time high, or at least form the base structure for the next bull market. What things do you think need to happen? What events are you looking for, whether they be crypto-specific or geopolitical sure. or involve macro also? like In your vision, what needs to begin what puzzle pieces need to connect to then eventually lead us into the next bull market? There's a lot of different moving pieces, and any of those moving pieces can have varying degrees of impact. Obviously, we look at the macro stuff. What we want to see is interest rates start to come down, right? Um, we also want to see more money printing, liquidity to rise. And right now, we are seeing money printing, but not in the USA. Um, not yet, anyway. I think we're going to see quite a bit of that uh, in the very, very near future. But right now, China as has always been the case, is lead, or now as always for the last few decades, it's been the case, is leading global liquidity, right? And they continue to lead global liquidity. And Japan also uh, leading global liquidity right now. So we need global liquidity to rise. When global liquidity rises, markets rise. It's probably the simplest part of the equation. But there's other very crypto-specific things that um, we want to be looking for, and that's seeing an increase in adoption, for example, for Bitcoin, which is something that we are seeing. We can see more companies coming on board, for example, um, Tether, they've been buying Bitcoin recently, and they're buying 75 million a month or something like that in Bitcoin at the moment, which is substantial, right? Now, they're a crypto native company, so it doesn't get the kind of attention that MicroStrategy, for example, brought on board, but we'll see other big companies coming in. We're going to see more nation states coming on board. All this sort of stuff builds towards a picture. You look at on-chain metrics, the number of people holding one Bitcoin or more on-chain reached a new all-time high. Right, we're over a million addresses now. The amount of Bitcoin on exchanges just keeps falling. In fact, this time is different, and I know that's one of those things you don't want to say in investing, right? But this time is different because, unlike all previous epochs of Bitcoin uh, having cycles, this cycle we are seeing the supply on exchanges in a continual downtrend. Every cycle previously, we saw you know a million Bitcoin more come into exchanges. Now it's just down, 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 down. And how long can that keep going on with BlackRock and Fidelity and all the other major asset managers, 26% of family offices saying they want to get into Bitcoin, a majority of the top 100 uh, asset managers saying that they are interested, according to Coinbase, uh, saying that they are interested in getting uh, exposure to Bitcoin for their clients. I mean, all the pieces are coming together and there will be inevitably a spark that lights off the the powder keg, so to speak. And when that happens is remains to be seen. I would imagine we need slightly better macro conditions for the market to feel like they can take that kind of risk again. But we have all these little things building up, basically adding more powder into the powder keg, essentially. Every time we get a new institution, a new corporation, a, a new country talking about legalizing Bitcoin for payments or whatever it might be, this all adds to the inevitable reality that we are going to see another explosive bull market the only question is when, and the most likely scenario for that based on previous cycles, based on the current liquidity cycle, assuming the U.S. doesn't do something dramatic in the opposite direction, is that we're going to see that probably playing out in 2024 after the Bitcoin halving, where we'll see this slow eventual rise up to the previous all-time high and reaching a new all-time high with blow off top. My guess somewhere early to mid-2025, we'll see how that goes. Very good assessment, and I like how you point to a lot of concrete progressions in Bitcoin accumulation. In your opinion, what's the most important thing happening in crypto right now? The regulations in the USA. It's probably the most important thing happening right now. Unfortunately, I wish it wasn't, but it, it – uh, well – 
much like we saw in the EUC, there's been really interesting regulatory stuff going on globally outside of the USA. I know we talk a lot about the USA because it's such a big market, but the Europeans just passed uh, MICA, which is a major piece of crypto uh, regulation that provides regulatory clarity in the EU. Amazing, right? Countries can do it. Come on, America. Uh, the UAE's done it. Hong Kong's doing it. The UK has just released a report saying we are committed to regulatory clarity on crypto within the next 12 to 18 months. We need, we see the need to get it done. We want to be an early mover in this space, which they're not even that early this by now, to be honest. France did regulatory clarity two or three years ago. Uh, so the USA dropped the ball big time on the regulation stuff. And obviously the USA is not the only market in the world, right? But it's a very, very important market. And in many ways, uh, the USA has been one of the earliest and biggest adopters of cryptocurrency technology, a huge amount of Americans own crypto. So what happens on a regulatory front in the USA is going to have reverberating uh, consequences, right? And whether or not they get it right, which right now they're getting it massively wrong by allowing the SEC to be the ones pushing regulation via, uh, via litigation. And of course, the White House, where we have a, a man who definitely has no idea what crypto is, let alone um, could ever use it, is pushing things like Operation Choke Point 2.0, which is seeking to shut down the on and off ramps for crypto in the USA. And we can see that that has been happening progressively over the last year or so. So there's definitely an all-out war on crypto right now in the USA. And there are obviously some people uh, in government who are pro-crypto. And we have seen, for example, a bill that was introduced recently. It's probably not going to do anything. But we did see a bill introduced that was trying to say, hey, actually, let's just declare all cryptos as commodities, which would dramatically change the entire landscape for crypto in the USA if it were to pass. Not that the president would probably sign off on that because he's rapidly anti-crypto because his banking bosses tell him to be. Yeah, I would say Biden is wildly out of touch um, with a lot of things and fintech technologies being one of them. I have a few more questions for you and then we'll, we'll go ahead and kind of close it up. Let's but it. without giving investment advice, what's something you think every new and experienced crypto investor should be doing right now? Right now, I think is the time to be actually dialed in and paying attention. This is the accumulation period. Um, the people who are buying in 2023, and I'm not saying everyone always thinks, oh, you bought, it means you took every single penny you own and went all in right now. Like, no, that's accumulation time. I'm, I'm dollar cost averaging every week, right? Buying more Bitcoin, top coins. Um, and I've got the view that, okay, well, I'm looking forward to late 2024, early to mid 2025, because the accumulation period now will end and there will be a new bull cycle. Only question is when that new bull cycle comes. And so this is what I have been focused on. And I think um, if you are an investor in this space, like now is the time to be paying attention. The unfortunate reality is that the vast majority of people will only pay attention at the worst and most dangerous time when it is the raging bull market and everything's going up and everyone's posting pictures of Rolexes and Coinbase is the number one app on the app store again. That is the time when you who are listening right now, you want to be selling. Right now is the time to accumulate. You sell in the mania. You don't buy in the mania. Most people will come in and buy in the mania and lose big time. They buy high and they sell low. Right now is the time to buy low so you can sell high later. So if your friends that you don't hear from often or who you've tried to convince to buy Bitcoin for at least like seven years now, uh, and they never do. But at the top of the bull market, when your friends start asking you, hey, should I buy Bitcoin? And it's trading for like 55 <laughs> or 60K a coin. That's probably time to think about taking a little bit of profit, isn't it? Yep. That's it. It's another one of the classic right. signs, right? Exactly. Very last question. So you've been in crypto through a few cycles. It sounds like three. And you're very familiar with the different variety of investor cohort, cohorts and their characteristics. So do you notice any difference between the pre-2017 crowd, the 2019 to 2021 bull market crowd, and those that are expressing an interest in crypto now? I think there's just different levels of jadedness, perhaps. The 2017 guys like, yeah, I've seen it all before. Just buy more Bitcoin. It's going to be fine. Um, and I think if you came in in like 2019, 2020, man, you came at a crazy time because there was just so much like insane stuff happening in the market from DeFi and then into NFTs and all that stuff. Where if you're showing up now, it's an interesting time. If you're, if you're like, if you've come into crypto in the last six months, 
well done because it's an interesting time to be paying attention to the markets. And if you are that new investor, um, you got to take your time, learn about stuff. The good news is that now markets are quiet, so you do have time to take your time and learn about stuff, unlike when you come in at May 2021 and everything's going crazy and you have this real intense FOMO. Now there's no FOMO. Markets are sideways, kind of boring, a little bit scary sometimes, but overall, you know, you have time to research stuff right now. So I think the longer you've been in the market in general, the more used to all this stuff are. I mean, if you if you invested in 2017, you've been through multiple China bans. You've been through all kinds of regulatory insanity. You've been through exchange hacks, DeFi hacks, all kinds of madness, bankruptcies, and on and on and on. So when you see the SEC suing both Binance and Coinbase in a 24-hour period, you're just like, okay, Meh. who cares? You might not <laughs> even withdraw fine. your coins from the exchange <laughs> if yeah. they've been there. You know, if you're, that's you it. Know, if you're ballsy yeah. enough to have left them on exchange, yeah. guys, exchanges are not event. banks. You know, yeah, yeah, get, yeah. Get your coins on your wallet. But thank yeah. you, thank you, thank yep. you. Yep, yep. Man, we're so aligned on so much, and it's been a real pleasure chatting with you. Um, actually, very refreshing. I feel like we hit all the different questions with great depth, and you've inspired me. I'm sure you've inspired the audience. If people want to hear more from you and keep up with all of your insights and opinions, where can they find you? Uh, come on, find me over at Twitter, Lark Davis on Twitter. So it's probably one of the best places to, we, we post everything there. You'll see the shorts, you'll see the videos, you know, the latest updates, fun memes, all that fun kind of stuff, guys. So come and follow me over there. It'd be great to see you. All right. Well, Lark, thanks for coming on today. It was great. Audience, you've been listening to Market Talks. We're here every Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern. Uh, if you enjoyed the conversation, you know, click like, share it with people, subscribe. We're here weekly. Thanks.